This is Seeing Red. Now in our 15th season of bringing you the best in independent Red Bulls news and opinion. Now here are your hosts, Mark Fishkin and Joe Goldstein. Yes, it's Seeing Red, the New York Soccer Roundup. Mark Fishkin here, joined tonight by Daniel Rubain of Area Sports Network. How are you, Daniel? I'm doing fine. Um, coming off a, a tough loss last week, but you know, got a rebound going going back home against New England. So let's absolutely, see what we can do. absolutely. Before we get going, please like, please subscribe. The subscriber list rolls continue to grow. We really appreciate appreciate that. Tonight on the show, New York takes a lead into halftime of Miami, and then they crumple in the worst 45 minutes in club history conceding six times, allowing Leo Messi five assists and a goal and a 12-minute hat trick by Luis uh, Suarez. It was grim, and thankfully we won't see the MLS Cup favorites until the playoffs. Maybe that's good. I don't know. Tonight on Seeing Red, we'll pick through the dregs of that horrific and historic loss. Is there a bull of the week in this performance? I, I do not know. Uh, we'll preview a much, frankly, easier opponent in the New England Revolution. I've been getting plenty of flack for that comment over the course of the week, and that's okay. It's not its not controversial to say that New England will be easier than, than Inter-Miami. Coming into Red Bull Arena on 90s night, our guest is Jake Cadenice of the Blazing Musket and your emails. And so, you know, in the first half, New York really did about everything right. They... Um, they got the early goal, which is so important to this team in this in this format. They threatened uh, a bit throughout the, the first half. And then two minutes into the second half, everything changed. And it really was like night and day. What, what happened, my friend? I think at the end of the day, it's just Messi and Luis Suarez showing up when they needed them most. Um, I mean, Red Bull, as you said, like played almost a perfect first half. They got a 1-0 lead going into the break and kind of looked like we were rolling, could maybe get a point or maybe even three on the road. But, I mean, when you're playing against the star power of of Lionel Messi, I mean, not much you can do when he's on his game, especially when, when you're just slacking behind maybe just one step. And, you know, Miami gets six in, in one half and, it looks bad at the end of the day for Red Bull. The Red Bulls conceded six in a match for just the fourth time in club history and six in one half. Well, they've never done that before. Uh, June 99, they went out to play the Kansas City Wizards and lost 6-0. On July 4th weekend in 2004, they took a six spot and a 6-2 loss to D.C. United. They had a, a friendly at Giant Stadium. Uh, Terry Henry scored for Barcelona in their 6-2 win over the Red Bulls and then uh, and then the other night. And so, I mean, you can make the argument that New York won the season series on away goals uh, with four plus two better than six at home. I, I guess the question is, you know, first of all, as you said, you know, the first goal um, was a, a world class and Carnell wasn't going to stop that. But once they went down two and once Messi finished, I really think a collective sense of how are we possibly going to get back in this match um, kind of set in. And then as the goals started to come, I mean, what, what does it say about the team? Did, did they lie down and quit? Did they realize at a certain point, because at three, one, I was like, get to the choppa. Like there's nothing here for us. Just don't get hurt. And I, I the Red Bulls played like that for the rest of the way. Yeah, it's just like uh, like I said. I mean, when when Messi and Suarez are playing at the top of the game, like you can't stop them at certain points. Like when when you see Messi double teamed by by uh, Edelman and JMI, and he just threads a ball to Luis Suarez, who does a scissor kick into the back of the net. I mean, <laughs> what else can you do? Um, I didn't I didn't see many goals where it's just a, a total collapse. It's just star players just finding the, the open space that's not even there for normal normal players. So, you know, you got to tip as, – as, at some point, you just got to tip your cap and say, you know what, that that's messy. So, you know. And with 23 regular season matches to go, I'm very confident that New York will not face Miami again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and so – the the drive to second in the east and a home and a and a home playoff berth i guess 
really starts this week. Will this result, you think, hurt the team long term? Like, do you think this? I mean, you know, we we all know about having short memories, and you you talk, you know, we'll talk to um, Schwartz tomorrow, and he he, I guarantee he will say, "There's nothing we can do about it," which is true. It's in the past, and we just have to focus on the next opponent, and that is the nature of pro sports, and that's the nature of football. But uh, do do you think there's lasting damage to be done here to the Red Bulls? Probably not. I think if if you saw like a, a rebound effect to when they lost three nil at Columbus, right. I would say probably. But after Columbus, they they went on a great run, uh, gaining points after points. So now a six two loss on the road in Miami, like you know, not many teams go down into Miami when Messi's playing and come away with victories. Not every time they're scoring six goals, but at a certain point, a 6-2 loss is the same as a 2-1 loss at the end of the day. So, you know, kind of just move on, learn from your learn from your mistakes, watch the video, and, and you know, improve from this. So, But, but as you said, when, when the answer is simply we're playing against a team that has just far too much talent, and we'll, we're going to get to this in our email segment about what you can do about that. New York really can't do anything about the the quality of the lineup until the summer transfer window. Do you think a loss like this puts more impetus behind Mario Gomez and um, you know and the folks at Red Bull to be like, look, I mean, we've heard that Griezmann's coming, we've heard that Marco Royce may be coming. Is is this are the the purse strings across the league about to open in a way that they've never before? No doubt. And I think a lot of, you know, GM sporting directors around the league were saying Messi coming here is going to start a revolution with with other players coming to, coming to, uh, abroad um, from from abroad from Europe. So I think this result maybe doesn't like open their eyes as much as Me- Messi originally coming to MLS. But I think it kind of sends a, a, a message to to Rebel Brass like in the summer they need to hit on some of these signings that they're going to bring in, especially the DP one, uh, the open DP spot that they have. So um, I think this result showed that they don't have the necessary high-end talent that some teams across this league have, like a Miami or a LA. But I think that that's going to that's gonna change, hopefully, by the end of the, the summer window. And the Red Bulls won't play the, uh, the Galaxy this year. They haven't played them in a very long time. They, of course, went out to LAFC, who is rumored um, to be getting Olivier Giroud, and mm-hmm. uh, they were able to hold them at, at their own stadium. So it, I guess if you talk about the super teams in MLS, and you can make the argument, I mean, New York is a B-minus super team, right? They've got Forsberg and Morgan's come back and play very well, but you really can't be an upper echelon team in MLS when you've got an open DB slot. And they'll have another uh, U22 slot as well, as, as that will obviously change during the summer window. It would be very nice to see um, Schneider convince Gomez to to go big, and um, and we'll see. So um, when, when when the team loses on the road like this, we we have a tendency of liking to say in the bowl of the week is the traveling fans and folks from the Viking Army got on the got on the game broadcast. I, I'm curious if you have any. Is there another bowl? That, that shone brightly for you in this uh, 6-2 defeat? I think in a defeat like this, like you, there's like no player that kind of stands out. Um, I guess you can say Van Zier getting that goal was, was good good for his confidence, especially coming from deep and, and burying the rebound. Yeah. Um, hopefully that opens up his game going forward. But other than that, I, I'd say this, this game's a wash. Nothing, nothing else positive really comes from this game and just move on to, to the next one. Yeah. And maybe Forsberg who, you know, just continued to play. He got, he got a penalty kick goal and mm-hmm, uh, yeah. a relevant penalty kick goal late, late in overtime. But I, I think we're going to go with traveling fans for this one. Yeah. Um, if you, if you made the trip to, on F1 weekend to get to Fort Lauderdale and, and go see this team and support them on, honestly, the, the you, you, you have now seen something you've <laughs> seen the worst half of soccer in club history. So yeah. Um, well done. Okay, so Saturday night at 7.30 is 90s night. And 
Daniel, were you were you alive in the nineties? I am a ninety seven baby. So oh, thank God. I'm 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 not that young, but you know, I'm I'm not that old either. So I'm okay. just in the perfect range. Fantastic. Well, happy nineties night to you and yours. Um, the New England Revolution is in the wooden spoon slot. Uh, they are two seven and one for seven points last and less. They've scored only seven goals in ten matches in the league, and they've conceded eighteen. That's the worst attack in the league. And away from home, they're one in four. Um, and again, they I'll, I'll go through their most recent uh, five appearances. They have both of their wins in their last five games. They they are coming off a win last week at the mighty Chicago Fire, 1-0. And you can make the argument, well, they were able to do to Chicago what the Red Bulls weren't. They've only scored three times in their last five goals, in the last five games. Woof. Um, since we've seen this team, they've had some really, uh, some decent additions for sure. But I want to turn your attention towards the uh, departure column because Gustavo Bo leaving this team has had a devastating effect. So for those of you listening and not watching, in comes Nick Lima, who one-time U.S. men's national team player, who's a bit of an MLS journeyman. Jonathan Mensah, who's a known quantity, came from San Jose, but he had spent time uh, at Columbus. He was the Columbus captain at one point, I believe. Mm -hmm. Henrik Rabas is a Slovakian goalkeeper. Uh, came from Lodz in Poland, represent Daniel. Uh, it, it late in April, very late, the team added Slovenian goalkeeper, I'm going to do my best, Aljaz Ivicic, uh, who came to the club on a free, and Xavier Ariaga joined the club from Seattle. He's been in the league for a little uh, little bit. But again, Gustavo Bo went back to uh, Teleris in Argentina. He said, thank you, my American adventure is now over. Justin Rennix, a little-used sl- striker, uh, went to Finland. Christian Makun, a little-used center back, went to Cyprus, to Anna Northis, is one of my favoritely named uh, sides. And Tomas Vacic Vac- like, went to Albacete in Spain. So those are the changes since we've last seen them. And, you know, you know, Dan, like, Caleb Porter needs time. Like, he <laughs> needs time to get it right. And New England has been an absolute mess since the departure of Bruce Arena. And you can make, as I, I found out on, on social media today, New England's been a mess since they ditched the crayon flag logo, and it is 90s night. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping that they bring that back. They probably won't like that. A friend of mine said that that Columbus, when they had their 90s night, they put the crayon flag logo up, and no, the team did, was not happy about it. All right. Uh, Richie Williams, uh, ankle biting midget of death, came in, and he uh, took care of the team. After Bruce Arena, we still don't have the story publicly on why Bruce Arena had to let, leave the team. Um, so Caleb Porter's here. He favors a possession style, and it's just been a mess. It's like New England doesn't get it yet. Um, yeah. They've won just twice against Chicago and Charlotte. Um, you know, he he is you know P- Porter is your typical playoff coach. He's a guy that that gets hot late and rolls through the playoffs, as the Red Bulls have seen. And the attack has just been dreadful. Harles Giel uh, has been a central figure, but he doesn't really have anyone to pass to. Argentine winger Tomas Chancale and Albanian striker Giacomo Vironi was supposed to be um, the, the answers, but it really, nothing's clicked for them this year. Um, Chancale, or rather Vioni, has been inconsistent. Sometimes he scores for fun, and other times he's just completely useless. Um, there's just no consistency. And it's they're the worst attack in the league. Um, and again, very quickly, New England's last five games. Uh, last week they won at Chicago, won nothing for their only road win this season. John Kale goal in the in the 62nd minute. Before that, they had a very similar experience in Miami that the Red Bulls did. John Kale got a goal in the first minute, and Miami got the five the last four. <clears throat> they were shut out one nothing at TFC. They were shut out two nothing at New England at uh, NYCFC. And then their other win, a one nothing win, home win against Charlotte. So again, when you're, you're the teams you're beating are not exactly quality sides, it kind of positions it. All right, the 98th all time meeting between these teams. That's a lot of games. The Revs have a five match win advantage in the all time standing. Although the Red Bulls uh, are very very strong, both of these teams do very well at home in the series. In fact. The home team has won the last four times these these teams have played. The last time they played at, at all, it was August 30th of last year 
and Rioni got a goal in a one nothing win at Gillette for the Revs. The last time they, these teams played at Red Bull Arena, it was in the league's cup group stage. And after a scoreless draw, the Red Bulls won on penalty kicks. And the last MLS game at Red Bull Arena was only a few weeks before that last summer when uh, Amaya and Wiki Carmona got the late goal in a 2 nothing win. The all-time score against the Revs, to the surprise of no one, is BWP <laughs> and uh, both Andres Reyes, who had that fantastic goal and two yellow cards back in the day. Uh, the, he has two goals, as does Wiki. This is what New England may look like from Caleb Porter. It's a 4 2 3 1 with Eva Chich, who has uh, played in the game. His first game was against Chicago last week, and he posted a clean sheet. So maybe the sign of things to come. The back line, Ryan Spaulding in America next to Henry Kessler. Uh, Kessler, if, do I have this right? Is Kessler a former Red Bulls um, Academy guy? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Uh, Xavier Ariaga, Ecuadorian, and then there's Nick Lima with a goal and an assist from right back. Mark Anthony K, known quantity. I think the Revs are probably his fourth or fifth MLS team. He has a goal this season. Matt Polster, who also – uh, has plenty of experience playing New York, has an assist. Chankale on the um, left has six goals in all competitions, including a run to the Champions Cup quarterfinals. Harles Gill, three goals and two assists. And Esmir, I'm going to do it. Esmir uh, Bajraktarovic, you're welcome. <laughs> he is a promising a young American talent yeah. with a goal and three assists and then uh, Rioni up top four goals and two assists again in all competitions consider injuries may keep these players out Brandon by Dewan Jones who uh, is dealing with a hamstring for me he is um, standing in the way of Jamai getting more time for the men's national team at left back Jonathan Mensah is hurt those are really uh, uh, no neck from Nyack Tommy McNamara <laughs> is yeah. on this team and he is also hurt so um, you know, I, this is, whoops, sorry. This is a team that, uh, you know, I'm not going to use the words, but New York coming off a very poor performance playing at home, New York undefeated at home this season. They're going to want to right the ship and get back into collecting points. What, what do you see happening on Saturday night, Daniel? Yeah. I just want to bring up, first of all, nineties night. So I agree with you. They should bring back new England's old, old logo. That that's a classic logo. They should have never went away from it, but, but yeah, I think this is your typical in, in two, two different ways. This is your typical trap game, but it's also a major bounce back game. Like you, we just showed you the lineup. I mean, there's some good players on this team, despite new England's record. Um, so it's 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 on Red Bull to come come out this game firing all cylinders like they did against Miami in the first half. They come out how they played in that first half against Miami with with uh, Forsberg cooking with with Morgan getting in behind and Dante also playing his part. I think this could easily be a, a runaway game for Red Bull. But I mean, if 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 we see anything close to what they they showed against Columbus or maybe in that second half against Miami, I mean. Easily knowing it could come in into Red Bull and, and squeak out a one note victory, especially how how uh, bipolar their defense has been this year. Yeah, for sure. Here's the thing: New England has not scored more than one goal in a match in league play. They've scored seven times in ten MLS games, and so if New York can get to two, mm -hmm. odds are pretty good that they're going to be able to hold off. And so um, Caleb Porter has a lot of experience playing against Jesse Marsh era Red Bulls teams. But as we know, this team doesn't act like those teams, right? I mean, they'll, they'll possess, they'll sit back and counterattack. There's a, um, a variability in playing style that I think Schwarz really is going to need to, to unwrap and unroll against Porter. I mean, if if New England can finally click on offense, New York's going to have, um, you know, a problem. And I'm, there's no there's no divine right that New York has to win this game. They're going to have to go out and perform to the best of their abilities and, and make it go. But again, it's going to be a good night. I'm I'm pretty I would imagine they're going to top 20,000 in, in the crowd. Right. It's going to be uh, a good match. Um, you know, if New England comes in in bunkers. 
and tries to hit. I mean, I haven't seen Chankale play. If, if I'd be curious to see if Porter's going to try to counterattack. I mean, he wants to play the kind of possession style that he played both in Columbus and in Portland. And if he does that, tries to play out of the back, you know, does the, you know, outside, inside, outside, inside ball to, you know, the old way they used to get Jesse's artist goals back in the day. I mean, New York's going to be um, challenged. Uh, if you're Schwartz, do you start Reyes or do you go back to Noah Ayla next to, um, next to Sean Nealis? I mean, it, it's kind of tough. I mean, after LA had his, his strong start, I thought he would easily solidify the number two spot uh, in the back. But I mean, since his, since he's um, played against Orlando and, and then LAFC and then last last home game with the red card, Cooper, yeah, it's just I, I I don't know if he's losing confidence or not. It's just his his positioning in the back line has been off uh, lately. And then obviously we know about Reyes. He's very hit or miss. He could yeah. have one of the greatest games you could see from a defenseman. And then next next moment, he's getting a red card because he's elbowed someone in the face. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I Probably if 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 we're saying New England's probably going to bunker, I no doubt I'm going to, to L.A. Um, his distribution from the back is unmatched with anybody in his team. So I think we're going to need that extra uh, ball playing uh, center back in – and in the midfield, especially with him able to drive through the midfield as well with the ball at his feet. So I'd probably go L.A. and uh, Nealis at, at the back. Yeah, it's a good question for Schwartz tomorrow, just the idea of how do you – I mean, we've asked him a number of questions this year about providing confidence to players that are struggling, but uh, not so much a 20-year-old, right? Yeah. Came in, a lot of attention, right? Made some teams of the week was named at like big surprises in terms of young players coming to the league. And yeah, right. Orlando with the own goal, uh, stepped in front of Cornell at LAFC and then throwing his hand up. Although as Joe Goldstein says, it was not a bad decision to do no. because certainly Ryan gold would have had a great shot, uh, had that ball gotten over. All right. So that said, uh, what, wh what do you think we're going to see? Let's throw out the, that magic rebound prediction and see what happens on Saturday. I think the the key for for this game is come out like you did in in the first half uh, against Miami and and you got to get a goal in the first half hour. I think the longer this game goes without a goal for for Red Bull, I think it creeps into our mind again that oh here we go again. Maybe maybe the goals are drying up uh, like they did last year. But I think if if uh, New England sits back the uh, the way they've played on the road this year, I think uh, Red Bull's pressure could get to them. Uh, I think we get that goal, that first goal inside 25 minutes, and I think once you get that first goal against New England, I think it's uh, it's uh, all 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 going going forward for Red Bull, and I think uh, we'll probably see either three nil or three one victory for for Red Bull at home, and they finally get another win at home and keep that keep keep undefeated at home. Yeah, this would be their first win if they can get it done in a month. So yeah. they, they really need all three points at one sitting. Uh, I'm going to give you three, nothing, and I'm going to take three, one. I think okay. after That's the fine. game, after the game is out of reach, uh, New England will get one. Uh, and I think it'll be exciting. And, and just a quick look forward. I mean, this is the time the, the, the hard, tough start of the season is behind them now. Yep, exactly. They, their next five games, New England, DC, NYC, Charlotte, and Orlando. The, there should be three wins there for New York. And if they're able to start building some momentum and the DC is doing some good stuff and Troy obviously will be pumped, mm. but, uh, and it's, a, it's, they're about to start three games in eight days. Oh, and happy uh, rivalry week brought to you by continental tire, <laughs> but uh, it's new England. And then at DC on Wednesday and, and home at city field for NYCFC. Uh, I get, I guess our rivalry week is, is only away. That's how we do it. Yeah. But ne nevertheless, this is the time for New York to pick up spots. So uh, when we're back on Seeing Red, we're going to talk from the Blazing Musket, Jake Cadenice, uh making a return to Seeing Red. So stay with us and we'll be right back.
We are back at seeing red, the New York soccer roundup. Red Bull is getting ready to face the revs for the first time this season. And we thought, why not bring back the senior writer at the blazing musket? That's Jake Gattanese. Jake, welcome back to seeing red, my friend. Thank you for having me again, sir. It's absolutely my pleasure. Jake, the revs were cruising along. They were a good team. They made the playoffs. They uh, were looking good under very smug Bruce Arena, whose smug factor was incredibly high as New England uh, kind of found a level of success we hadn't seen in some time in these parts. And now they're not that good. What happened, my Mm. friend? Okay, let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. Um, In the last, I'm going to say, better part of 30-something games between Bruce Arena being suspended, being fired, leaving, not really sure exactly how that happened to the beginning of the Caleb Porter era. Um, We've had two major problems with New England. One has been morale, which does not, I don't know if that's necessarily a thing in soccer anymore, but your team is in the dumps. They're not going to play well. And that was certainly the case last year. And I think largely the hope was under Caleb Porter that you were going to take effectively the exact same team that was second in the Eastern Conference prior to Bruce Arena's suspension, firing, whatever it is we're going to call it, and basically run it back and just go, hey, we're going to reset. We're going to get everyone on the same page. We had a good offseason. We brought in some veterans to you know help bolster the back line, the fullback spot. We're going to, we're going to run it back. We're in the Champions League somehow. Thank you, <laughs> Philadelphia or whoever it is, you know, Columbus for winning the MLS Cup and getting us into the CCL. That was a right. fun quarterfinal run. And then it just hasn't worked. And part of the reason why it hasn't worked is that the, there's been some injuries. There's been some uh, guys who haven't yet fully come back into the fold. Dylan Barrero, Brandon Bay, Dewan Jones is now missing a couple weeks uh, with injuries. So I don't think we've seen the best lineup for the Revs yet this year, which is a problem. And then the other problem is the system that Caleb Porter has installed is a system that is far too slow and possession and build up. And that's not what new England has ever done. This is not the Lee Wynn J heaps era where we're going to get to the final third, park the bus on the wrong end of the field and pass the ball 200 times in the final third and drive everyone nuts with just where is the ball going? What are they doing? Why do we have eight players behind the ball? And they're still attacking us. It's it's not working. There hasn't been enough adjustments. Hmm. The reinforcements the team brought in a couple weeks ago don't make a whole lot of sense because it seems like they're doubling down on the buildup play with a new center back and a new goalkeeper. I don't know. There's a lot of questions that are still yet to be answered, and they need to be answered quickly because you're not going to play a team as bad as Chicago every week. Right. Well, you're not going to play a team as bad as Chicago this week. Um, and hope. so uh, let me ask. I mean, Gustavo Bo doffing his cap saying thank you very much for your time in your lovely country i'm i'm now going back to to argentina and you've got uh guys like tomas chancalay coming in um what 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 i have not seen chancalay i'm just kind of curious is he like for like i understand the idea of you know route one and long balls and chasing him down and stretching a defense is chancalay a guy to a do that or b to play in Porter's possession style. Oh no, he very much has a lot of Gustavo Bo in him. And last year he, he fits much more of, we never actually knew if Gustavo Bo was a winger or a second striker that just played out wide. Thomas Chancla is very much a winger. And one of the major issues tactically, New England's had to play him as a number nine, which doesn't help anyone because he's not getting the ball as a number nine. And then you isolate what he does very well, which is, get on the ball and attack people like you saw against Chicago. Hey, here's a loose ball in the, you know, 35 yards away from goal. I'm going to pounce on it, run to the top of the 18. No one's going to step up on me and I'm going to fire. That is textbook Gustavo Bo. So he has that in his bag. Chonkley last year was sneakily one of the best finishers in the league, not just on the revs in the league. Hmm. It's six goals last year when the revs were an absolute mess. And he was still finding ways to get on the, you know, get on the ball and score. And for a team that was bad at offense last year, that was one of the lone bright spots. And, you know, we haven't been able to get Chonkalai fully involved like we've had last year because, again, he's playing up top. Yeah. A couple of issues for this. 
a couple of reasons for this. One, Jack Mulvaney has not been good. Yeah. He also got a red card at 30 minutes in against the DC United in the home opener uh, or the season opener. So that means you're losing him for that game. You're losing him for the next game. So Chonkla is now playing up top. He's not a number nine. He's not even a second striker. Type. He's an out and out winger who's just very, very good at finishing. The other problem is Bobby Wood has been hurt. So you don't even have your backup striker. You have no one else uh, that can play out and out striker. Chonkla is just the third guy because he's the best one suited for it. And that's really the only blemish I would put on the front office is you had a guy like Justin Rennix, a guy like Adebayo Smith who went to Minnesota via trade. You could have had those guys on the roster again this year, and for whatever reason you chose not to. And so you only went in this year with two strikers, and neither of them were available for basically three weeks, three games in, in the beginning of the year. And, th- and that's a problem. The team has Chunk results like in three of the team's 10 games that they've played, a win, including last week, and a draw against the Chicago Fire, and a win against Charlotte 1-0. And that are the only times that New England has picked up points in the league. The Red Bulls do not have a, come from a city to start with the letter C. And so I guess the question is, what, what will be different this week that uh, Porter may roll out to attempt to attack New York? And I, I, use, it, hope- I use the term attack very loosely so yeah well ah oh god judging by the fact that both of us have played miami recently and that went pretty badly poorly for both I assume of us, we, yes i i assume we both tried to do kind of similar things against miami and it both it went poorly both ways you can't sit back against miami you have to go whatever whatever level of attacking you think you're playing against miami you need to like triple it the ball cannot be in your own half you need to get the ball as far away from you as possible keep it away from your own goal just send the ball down the other way I don't think the Reds will be nearly that aggressive, but in general, the second half against Chicago, you saw what New England can do when they actually push the accelerator and actually attempt a counterattack. It works. The team actually functions. The ball moves two, three lines at a time. You're up the field. You're, you have the opposing defense on the back foot. Building the ball up from the back is very nice. Having center backs that can pass the ball around are helpful. Having goalkeepers that can do that are helpful. This is not the UEFA... Champions League semifinals. I honestly do not care how many center backs in MLS can pass or how many goalkeepers can pass. This is Major League Soccer. We do two right. things here. We score goals and we counter and we probably do a lot of concacaf stuff in between. I don't need the soccer to be beautiful. I need it to be effective. And right now the Revs are not playing effective soccer. And I think last week against Miami, the Red Bulls did not play effective soccer. And I think in the second half, has- they had a one yeah, nothing lead going into halftime and yeah. Uh, had the worst half in club history. But and, yes, and, continue. You know, and well, then, you know, Miami does, you know, the Miami thing. Bring you're something. Just like, oh, look, now you're down by three. And you're just like, wait a minute, hold on. We just got into the second half. What happened? So I don't know. I think if, if New England balances their attack, I understand you're going to have to build from the back sometimes. But generally, the MO for the Revs is if you turn the ball over, you have about six seconds to get back inside your own 18 because the Reds will be there in seven. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the style that I want this team to have. I want them to be that level of aggressive when someone turns the ball over. Now, the issue is that Caleb Porter has also said, this is supposed to be a pressing team that can help generate turnovers. (laughs) And New England does not have under any circumstance, a group of players who are effective at pressing the ball. They have two out and out attacking wingers, Carlos Hill and Giacomo Veroni, who is, I like Jack Mulvaney. I want to, you know, just slam Jack Mulvaney around because he hasn't been playing all that well. But like Jack Mulvaney is a nice all around number nine guy who just right now can't buy a goal. He can help you in the press. He can help create turnovers, but you really want him as the guy pressing the lines when you have the ball going the other way. And they're just not doing that. They're taking their sweet old time, getting the ball up past half court, taking their sweet old time, even finding someone to even get into the final third. And that needs to stop because we've seen time and time again, this new England team, is at their best when they are attacking aggressively, when they're attacking directly, when they get a one-on-one opportunity and they have the opponents on the back foot. And they need to look for those opportunities and not just wait to let the other team get settled. Because we've seen over the last six, seven years, you have the Rebs against a settled defense are not going to break you down. They're just going to settle for something long, hope for a set piece. It's not the intricate soccer that I think Caleb Porter thinks they can play certainly they can do it every now and again but it can't be the primary offense i don't think looking at at this lineup uh that we have here 
tell me about the the young American with the twenty five uh, letter last name that'll be playing on the right, most likely. Okay, so so the name is Esmir Barakterovich. Okay, that I think mostly correctly. Yeah, uh, he is a Olympic eligible winger. I think even a U twenty eligible winger. And along with Noel Buck, who's not in this lineup for reasons right. I'm not sure, um, <laughs> is one of the, the two, you know, big homegrowns that New England has. Um, Esmir bradford Terrific has what we like to call um, in the Blazing Musket uh, chat room, the 10 out of 10 Deuce Dempsey try stuff factor. Okay. The one on one. He likes to be tricky. Um, he will do things where you're just like, ah, oh, that would be really cool if it worked. Well, I have to go <laughs> defense. And then he'll track you down and go back and play defense. Um, so that of of the bright spots for the Rebs last year, Bajor Terovich was definitely one of them. At some point, you're going to see a lot more of Dylan Barrero, who mm -hmm. is the Rebs U22 signing, who's recovering from a, a season-ending injury last year. He's just getting back into the swing of things. I don't even think he has 200 minutes in league play yet. I think he's got two or three appearances now. So... Eventually, what New England should be doing is those two guys, Bezotavri and Buck, should be playing at minimum 30 minutes a game. If they're not starting, they should be coming off the bench in the 60th minute. If you're the New England Revolution, you're Caleb Porter, and you want this team to play a possession-based system, why Noel Buck is not one of your starting midfielders next to probably Matt Polster? I don't know, because he's probably your best technical number six, number eight type in the pool behind Carlos Hill. Um, you know, some people might say Ian Harks could, could fill that role as well. I actually agree. But if you're going to play a possession-based system and you have two effectively destroy number sixes or number six, number eight combos in Polster and MAK, Mark Anthony Kai, your system already is on the back foot because you have two sixes who are not there to pass the ball. You have right. two fullbacks who are right now second stringers. Ryan Spaulding and, and Nick Lima are not your starting center backs. Um, but they're, they've been forced into action and they've been great, but they are, you primarily want them to be at best two way players and probably more defensive first options than key guys in possession. So there's a lot of things tactically with new England that isn't working out of the four, two, three, one, the ball spending way too much time in their own half. There are turnovers that are occurring in their own final third, when you should just be clearing your lines and letting the top four guys just go and figure it out. And, yeah, stop rubbing your hands like that. I know I know yeah. what the Red Bulls are going to try and do, and that's why I don't <laughs> want the Revs to do what they've done the previous largely nine games, which is screw around in their own half. Because against a good team, Chicago would have had two goals last week in the first half. Yeah. But, you know, I joked it was May the 4th. They brought their, storm, their Stormtrooper shooting boots with them. So there you go. They missed everything on target. And the Revs sniped one from, you know, the top of the box on a turnover, and we stole the game 1-0. I don't think the Revs were the best team overall in that game i think each team had a pretty decent half no one was all that great this is i think chicago's the what third worst team in the east and the revs are the worst so yeah not exactly the you know shining beacon of mls eastern conference <laughs> play that we come to expect i think from the revs and red bulls over the last six or seven years when we've both been i think perennial playoff teams the home team has won the last four uh matches in this series um it's usually very hard for the revs to come in and get a result in red bull arena unless jermaine jones is cutting dax mccarty in half <laughs> and not getting a card for it and it's hard for the red bulls really to do much at gillette uh, over the years so i guess the question is that said my friend do you do you have a an inkling as as what uh, a prediction might be for saturday night at red bull arena i would like to see the revs scrape out a draw in this one and it would have to be a very ugly draw i don't think it'll be like a back and forth like two two three three kind of game i think it would have to be one one um the only place i think new england hates playing more than red bull arena is mercedes-benz in atlanta because i think every time we go there we give up like five um so obviously it's it's not that level of house of horrors it's just this is you know it's an old school mls game you know chances are going to be at a premium and you you better take them because if you don't take them, the other teams certainly will. And I certainly trust a lot more of the Red Bulls guys, particularly coming off of a game where the yeah, second out. half was really rough. And I have a feeling they're going to be a little upset that they kind of let that one get out yeah. of hand when they didn't need to. And that, that might come back and that might get taken out on the revs a little bit. And it, you know, it's a, it's a revs back line that, you know, you could argue this is three out of four guys that weren't starters at the beginning of the year. Yeah. 
for sure. If you count Brandon by not being able, you know, available from the start of the year. So, you know, that's, you know, kind of a thing, you need a new goalkeeper as well. If our yard of uh, uh, starts again. So, you know, you've got a lot of moving parts still for the Rebs early on in the season. I, I don't think that's where they expected to be. And that's why they're in the basement still struggling to climb out. And I don't, I don't think it happens this week. If it does, I'll be very happy, but I, I have a feeling this is going to take a lot longer to retool and have Caleb Porter kind of sort of get off of what he thinks is best for this team and actually start doing what the team can actually, you know, play effectively. Well, if the Red Bulls get to two, the odds are pretty good that they're going to win since the Revs have not scored two goals in a league game this season. Jay Cadniz is the senior writer once again at the Blazing Musket covering all things Revs. Jake, it's 90s night at Red Bull Arena. Is there a chance we'll see the crayon flag? We better, we better. This, there we you mean go. The greatest, the greatest logo in Major League Soccer the history. Greatest logo in all of pro sports. Right. Uh, well, second grade. I mean, the, the Hartford Whalers are still a thing. But... Uh, they're pretty good. Yeah. Well, by if your blue shirts, by the way, blow that against the NHL team that shall not be named, I will be upset. Yeah. No, they're they're going to be fine. Uh, I hope. I hope. Jake, so. I hope Jake so. where can fans find you on the socials? Uh, you can find me at Jake at an East four three uh, when I am actually up and awake during normal business hours which is almost never because i work the overnight shift uh for my day job and uh yeah we do a weekly preview we've got to find uh someone to help me in for the red bulls preview this week got to sort out who that's going to be and hopefully we can find out uh some more information about the red bulls and see if there's a chance that they're uh maybe going to be a little bit nicer to us because they were very nice to miami last week and gifted them a couple of goals they're late i'd like i'd like one of those i'll settle for one of those i don't even need All to right. win i just want one of those gifts that you gave miami and i'll be okay well when you sign Messi and suarez we can talk about it uh uh-huh. we've got more seeing red coming up after this short break thanks jake We are back at Seeing Red, the New York Soccer Roundup. Thank you for staying with us for our third segment. Mark and Daniel Rebane here. Write us, please, won't you, every week. I was surprised that we did not get more email this week. Usually when the team loses, people have lots to say. But you can write us at seeingredny at gmail.com anytime. You don't even have to wait till after the game. You can just have a, like a Red Bulls thought in your head and just say, I wonder what those guys think. All right. Here's Rafa Barrero, friend of the show from way back. He says, thankfully, we have seen Red to be our therapist during the dark moments. I'm beginning to feel that Inter Miami signing so many, so many superstars, Daniel, and dominating. This is starting to look like the NASL Cosmos era of the past, and that didn't end too well for pro soccer in the U.S. Your thoughts, Rafa Barrero from Pembroke Pines. Is this, I mean, you can, I see it. I absolutely get it. Um, certainly, the, you you got to be a billionaire to enter this league at this point. So I'm just kind of curious. Is, is this NASL is it 3.0 happening now? What's happening? Um, well, obviously, I wasn't around for when the Cosmos were, were as big as they were with Pele and other names that they brought in. But I think what Miami's doing is, is, is good in a way for, for MLS because – for a long period of times, we we would have superstars here and there. There'd be the one superstar on each team, but I think uh, at a certain point, this the, this league needs to grow. This this league needs to have more players that people recognize and want to go to to the stadiums and see. Like like for for a long time, like Red Bull obviously had Thierry Henry, Tim Cahill, and other other big players, but like. And dig out. Yeah, I mean, like, but even when they had Henri, they still couldn't sell out. Obviously, that's different circumstances with with stadium, and you know, you've brought that up. But for I'm saying for other other markets, like this, kind of just opens up the the league to more more money being spent on teams, and and that's a good thing. Even for like the smaller players, wages start going up. Um, we've seen this in other leagues, like the minimum wages go up and up more and more money comes in the the tv deals start going up so i think obviously back in the day obviously tv deals weren't as as big as they were but with all the money that's out there for especially in the game of soccer i mean i think this inevitably 
inevitably would be a good thing. We might not see the 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 prospects of 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 that for maybe a decade, especially after the World Cup that comes in twenty twenty six. Yeah, but I think um, with the way that uh, MLS is going, I think this is this is good for the casual fan and and other other fans trying to watch games in their own like state or city and instead of watching the premier league or the bundesliga or la liga where they grew up watching with their parents and you know that's where they became fans ultimately yeah i mean i think the difference now just back to to rafa's original point is like you know the the og nasl cosmos was a league that went from 12 to 18 to 24 teams in three years right yeah and then and that league was the cosmos and literally everyone else yeah and so i see the parallel especially from what we saw on saturday night in fort lauderdale that mm. the, the talent on miami is clearly outsized uh clearly but yeah. i think what you're going to start to see this summer right this is all a build towards 26 daniel exactly as, as yeah. i think you said rightly Mm-hmm. And the idea of MLS teams grabbing national team players, making the MLS a destination that players will be able to continue to sharpen their their skills at, building up to um, 2026. I mean, we've we've talked about for years for young American players, like do you stay or do you go? You got to mm-hmm. be playing in the in the great clubs of Europe. Well. If you're on the cusp of 30 or on the wrong side of 30 and maybe you're you can't find your way in, you know, you've got a bloated contract at a second tier Bundesliga team, but you're a consummate pro and you would be a major major building block for any team in the US, well come to Nashville or come to St. Louis yeah. or you know come, you know, and work your way back, get yourself back into good graces. I mean, remember when Oh, and Beckham came here and then he went back. He played a little bit or went on re went back and scored the goal for Arsenal in the FA cup. Yep. It's like, well, I, I guess uh, MLS didn't completely degrade him or, or even Zlatan, right. Went right back over and started scoring goals. So I think it's a very different league. And I think, as I said before, since every, since all the new, the last 10 teams that have joined the league, like you have to be a billionaire, you yeah. have a billion dollars. It, and and make this not your principal business. Yeah, you guys have money to spend, and I think what you're going to start to see during the summer transfer window is they're going to spend it. So I let's hold this notion because if we're still like this at the start of the 2025 season, I I think there'll be some real questions. But I think you're going to like I think people's hairs are going to get blown back by the player the talent's about to come in the league. All right, here's wait. The, could I could I add yeah, that to that real quick? Um, sure. Again, you obviously uh, in the future, you still want MLS to kind of be a development league at, at a certain level. Yeah. You, you obviously want your superstars to attract uh, eyeballs and attention and fill seats. But at the end of the day, the real money is is selling selling talent. Um, but but now you want to be able to keep hold of that talent until maybe 21, uh, 22, and then they go over – to, to a Bundesliga or Premier League instead of 17 or 16 or 18. So right. I think nowadays it's a different game, especially in the U.S. American players are, are getting better and better every year. So I think, again, just to harp on what I was saying, I think this is a good thing. Just the, the amount of eyeballs that a Messi is bringing in is, is, is great for the league. So hopefully they can keep bringing in players. Um, obviously, there's only one Messi, but – there's other players just below his tier level that, that you can still bring over. Yeah. Luka Modric didn't start for Real Madrid in the in the semifinals today. Doesn't he want to play 90 minutes? He probably doesn't. He's an old man. <laughs> uh, I mean, and look at players, you know, like like Russell Rowe and Columbus scoring, you know, big goals in Champions Cup. Homegrown players, Patrick Schulte. I mean, these are guys that the, the, the challenge with bringing in big European talent, right, is that that's one less spot for a young American or young Canadian, if you will, pl- uh, you know, player to, to be getting quality minutes. And so it, it'll be a struggle because remember, at first it was, you know, we want to be the, you know, we're going to be one of the top 10 leagues in the world, right? And everyone laughed at Garber. And then it was like, well, we want to be a league of choice. 
like like that means anything <laughs> right and so and, and now the team i think is understood that, that they need to be a selling league rightly it's it's a difficult mix no other league has this challenge yeah i mean and even liga emekis like they realize that they've got to change some stuff up and yes you know columbus has a one game uh in mexico to win the champions cup and and obviously i mean the us is so far ahead of the the Mexican national team right now, but like Liga MX teams, they can't be so, uh, you know, xenophobic either. Right. Like they've got to bring in good talent and they've got to export more talent. Like it's a global game. So um, good chat. I like this. Good, good stuff. All right. Here's Dan McDevitt says guys uh, for a long time, the rebels have regardless of what else is what, what or else has happened, has been able to count on having a stout defense in front of goal. Even in years in preseason when it looked shaky, things had a way of working themselves out. But in the last four games, our center backs have become a liability through red cards, conceded penalties, or just poor play. The stakes at the back were also directly responsible for the team's playoff exit last year. Some time ago, I heard a television commentator said that the Red Bull system makes the center backs look better than they might otherwise. Do changes that Schwartz has made to the style demand more from the position? While Miami's attacking skill is an outlier, the quality in MLS has been improving steadily over the last few years. Is it time to start ringing alarm bells? For years, we have uh, fans been demanding more scoring. And while that's still needed, maybe we have to consider if the players in the back are good enough too. And, I mean, we talked about it in the first segment, uh, Daniel. Like, I mean, Ayla and um, – it's, it's not just Ayla and Reyes because you had – that the the PK call against uh, against Sean Nealis at LAFC, and you can say that it's a it's a borderline call. I, I thought it was a borderline call. Um, I don't think but, it was a pen. Yeah, you know, <laughs> okay, uh, but yeah, it's it's been tough of late for sure. Yeah, I think um, I think these these past couple of games have been kind of outliers. Obviously, you know certain mistakes here and there like that that's what before the Miami game though that's what we were the the goals we were conceding they were just either mental mistakes positional errors like those are those are fixable it's not like Sean Nielsen is getting run off the park that he's just giving up four goals because he's getting run by or Noah LA is just not defensively capable I mean it's just mistakes here and there that you can fix in training it's just you know gaining your confidence back of a Noah Ayla. It's just Reyes maybe getting more consistent, even though, you know, we probably won't see that. But, like, <laughs> at the end of the day, I think you have a back line that we saw last year was top five and goals against. I mean, they were very, very stable at the back. I think um, bringing in L.A. is, is, a, is a change because not many center backs Red Bull have had were, were as great as, on the ball as he was. Yes. And I think it's just – him and Neil is trying to understand and, and Cornell as well, trying to get that chemistry down to, you know, leave a ball here or there, you know, yeah. this pass going there, this pass going there. But I think defensively that will, it, it, it will come with time, especially bringing in such a young and uh, potentially driven uh, signing like Noel. The Red Bulls have conceded zero or one goal in eight of their 11 matches. The only three matches where they've conceded more than one at Col at Columbus, at LAFC, and at Miami. Yeah, exactly. So, and again, this has been a very tough start to the season from the schedule makers. And it will get easier as we go. Yep. And so, and that means more forgiving i am i am glad that the team had such a tough road to start because i think it really identified for schwartz you know the areas and for schneider mm -hmm. these are the areas that we're going to need help with as we go um but you know playing miami albeit once when things went very well without Messi, right yeah i mean i don't think any other team has played miami twice in the first 11 games of the season so, so. Uh, and and away at LAFC and Vancouver, um, and and the defending MLS Cup champs. It's been yep. tough. So I agree that things have been a little shaky back there. But I am hoping that starting this weekend, 
the margin for error gets a little lighter and New York is going to be able to get out there and play some teams that are beneath them in the table and they're going to be able to score some goals. So, um, Dan, thank you so much for your note. Uh, one note before we go, uh, if you can send your pol- positive energy on uh, Thursday the 9th to Joe Goldstein, it's a big day for him. Just be thinking about him. Uh, we are thinking about him all the time. So, yes, Daniel calls Saturday night's 90s night game a – what was your no, prediction? 3-0 three three. No victory. All right, I'm going to call it a 3-1 victory. Daniel, this is a good time. You had fun? Yeah, I mean, every time I come on here, I, I enjoy uh, talking with you, you know, chatting it up about different topics going on. So just happy to be back and can't wait, wait to be back next time. All right. Like to thank uh, Zach Feldman for stats and Jay Cadenice from the uh, Blazing Musket for stopping by. I'd like to thank everyone who wrote in and thank you so much uh, for watching and listening. Again, the likes, the subscribes. Thank you. We will be back. We are pro- we were not going to be back uh, before the DC game, but we will be back before the Hudson Derby. So uh, thanks so much for watching, everyone. Episode 573. Wow. Of seeing red. We'll be back soon, folks. Have a good night. <laughs>